let me know if you can see the the sheets mm -hmm. the can you see the screen at the moment you can perfect let me just do that quickly perfect so yeah thank you very everyone thanks everyone for for joining the session um i i don't think i mentioned it in the session this morning but it's uh, town hall uh, session 13 so thanks very much for for joining us today um what i'm going to be taking through you through today just very uh briefly is we're going to focus the main focus we're having for the session today is really just looking at roadmap plans for quarter three um a big shout out to everyone um i know it's always it's quite uh, it's not always easy to pinpoint specific features that you're looking for but thanks so much for anyone that did provide any input or anything um that always helps us just to understand what uh, your end clients are asking for um, and helps us to really focus where we need to put our attention to when it comes to the roadmap plan. So we're going to spend most of the time on the roadmap plans. Um, after that, we briefly just going to touch a little bit on the site glide automation delivery. So we're finding, um, you know, the last couple of years, email delivery is much stricter. So I just want to quickly just run over just the process. If you're finding that your clients aren't getting any delivery or maybe it's going to junk or anything, just what the process is, just to either request the information to log into your instance, um, and then also just the process to actually authenticate and set up the SPF and DCOM from SendGrid side. So that's the, the best place to start. Um, and we'll just briefly take you through that. And then also what we're going to do is we've actually got a really nice module that should be released in the next week or so. We, we're currently calling it the, the SendGrid CRM Sync module. But ideally, what this module will become in the future is it will become a, a general CRM sync module. So it won't just be for SendGrid. It, we would like to um, also just run it out to, you know, MailGrid, ActiveCampaign, um, and then also look at how it can be used maybe for more general CRMs as well. So we're just going to take you through just a very brief little a couple snippets into the product. Um, it should be into the module. Um, it should be out in the next week or so, and then we'll let everyone know uh, either in Discord or on a mailer uh, when that is available and also just send through any documentation. But we've just got a couple little snippets just to give you, just to show what is happening. Okay. And then after that, what we'll do is we'll just open it up to the floor. If there's any other business or questions, maybe frustrations, anything that you would like to raise with us, we can dive into and, and answer and get you know to those questions or either take it back to for myself and Matt um, to look into it for you. Okay. So yeah, so we're going to jump straight into uh, roadmap plans for quarter three. So yeah, so this is um, this is our main focus of the next features that are going to be coming out into the product. Um, you know, we are trying to get some big features done at the moment, but also what our focus is, is that we want to ensure the most important uh, and valuable small requests are also attended to. So it's not always an easy thing for us. You know, I bet we've all got many, you've all got many uh, clients that are asking for a bunch of different features, um, but these are going to be our focus for the, the next kind of output of, of, of the roadmap. And then we will jump through and go through the other ones coming up after that. So a big focus on the, and, I, and as, as I've mentioned here, these are these are more features that are kind of key features that are put, that are put to push forward. Let me just admit there quickly. So these are really key. These are features that are going to help the platform. So as you can see, uh, some of our focus ones is user roles. So user roles has been something that's been yeah. coming up a while. Um, so you can, We'll be able to now manage certain user access roles. Um, and that's a real important thing just to streamline how you can manage the site, manage the user um, without, without actually, um, you know, asking for assistance from us or the team. Okay. Another key focus for us, so Zapier integrations with automation. So um, definitely in being able to set up the Zapier to run with automations is definitely something that's been requested quite a bit. So we will be looking to build on top of that. So at least your automations that are going out, um, it does add a bit of extra functionality uh, as well. 
do note, um, I, I will send off a breakdown of all these upcoming features. So I will pop it in Discord as well if you want. So you'll have all of it as well. I'll pop it through over after the session. Um, but yeah, as I said, happy to make notes. And hopefully if you've got questions, you can we can discuss towards the end, which is great. But yeah, so we will look at doing that. And then also the one other thing we're looking at. So option to turn off certain features or cases on form. So this is this pertains to a bit of a usage type feature. So what we find is there's some certain clients or certain clients have certain needs around what sort of cases or CRM orders want to be tracked. If um, you know if you are looking um, at using all of them, there are, can be quite a few usage of cases that are happening, and it could be a CRM order. Um, I mean, could it be a product actual e-commerce order? It could be a uh, e-commerce case. So there's a few different examples of that. And what we want to try to do is and see is that if you have certain clients that perhaps don't need to track or have a, a whole track of certain cases, we'll be able to turn off on certain features. So that just means your, um, your usage will be able to be managed a little bit better for your sites. Okay. And then the fourth and final one is really, really, really important. I think just from a, from a reseller perspective, is just for, you know, because we've moved into a new direction with our billing, um, what's, how, what's, what's really important with this is, is for you to be able to see per, per site historic data or the archive data. So if you're going and invoicing a client or a client comes wants to come back to you and wants to query maybe an invoice a couple months back, we want to be able to show that historic usage so that at least you can go back check it, explain what that was. If maybe there was a jump in emails, perhaps there was a jump um, in certain storage or something was added to the site. Um, but this is going to give you a better view from within the portal to actually see back um, for a period of time. So then you can always um, you know, have that historic data and that makes it a, a lot easier for everyone to manage any queries or if you need to do a recon of source for a client going back a bit. Okay. So yeah, these are definitely the, the next up and coming ones. So as I said, it's the key feature that really are going to push the platform forward. After that, so coming up after next, and these are ones that are queued for the next, the next batch of features. So we're focusing on things like the menu builder. So, you know, version two, we want to improve the menu builder, give you a bit more functionality around that. We also want to make and simplify the way um, you, you create actions or do things within the platform. So currently how it works is sometimes you've got to go into each certain uh, item and you've either got to enable and disable. So we would like to make it a bit easier where you can select multiple web apps or maybe forms or anything like that. Um, and then you can also bulk disable or enable much easier. So it's really nice, especially if you're dealing with a bunch of different items and quite a lot, you don't have to go through each of that quite a bit which is a lot slower. Okay. Other thing we're looking at is, so looking at web apps, um, what we also wanted to create was a, a web app edit form layout. And um, this is something that's definitely coming up more and more with, you know, front end kind of editing on a, on a web app. So this is a nice edit form layout that will be included. Um, and that'll make the, you know, setting up any web apps that is a edit type form, um, at least having a, a much easier layout to do so. Okay. One thing we also looking at is we're also looking at adding order custom fields. So what's what's actually where this um, this use case has come from? So we'll see further down um, on the I think two pages down. We've had a lot of requests for especially around e-commerce. We've had a lot of requests around managing the different statuses of orders instead of adding. That is a certain feature we feel um, enabling you with order custom fields. You'll be able to set up specific um, fields according to a different status. Because you might have a, a certain amount of statuses or a certain grouping of statuses, this allows you to create and have a little bit more flexibility to actually enable you to do that. Okay. Over and above that, we've also got just a, a very, you know, straightforward the enabling and disabling of categories. Um, this is something that's been coming up and I believe you have to either delete the categories for, for you to disable them. So we wanna make sure it's a lot easier for you to enable and disable categories um, instead of, able, you know, looking for a loophole or having to 
delete those categories and re-add them. Okay. Also just around e-commerce, so uh, product copy, this is really nice if you're adding a bunch of different uh, products, maybe very similar. Um, it's just much easier to copy the product and create all the specific in information each time. Um, this will allow you just to speed up your process, especially um, if you're having to input large amounts of products, but you know there are other routes of importing that as well. Okay. And then yes, also around e-commerce, we want to include multi-images on attributes. So with any of your product attributes, if you want to break down the different attributes within a product or grouping of different products and the attributes, at least now you'll be able to also include multi-images um, on those attributes. Currently, it's only singular, but at least for now, you're also going to have multi attached to it. Okay. And then also what we're going to look at is we're going to apply discount codes to specific products. So instead of someone going and maybe adding a discount code on the front end, you're going to be able to add discount codes to specific products. Um, specifically, you know, this product or that one and then differentiate between the two as well. Okay. So that's queued after what's up next. In the future, so in the future, when we look at these sorts of um requests what we find is it's these are usually requests that you can probably set up in the system um but these are something that we'll look to add further down the line so promotional discounts um this is something that you you, you could rather maybe use like the different display pricing so the different display and the actual display price versus the actual price and then abandoned cart notifications this is obviously a key part of e-commerce um but it's it's definitely um, it's something that you can already set up within, um, you know, within the actual automations, but we will look eventually to look at adding it um, further down the line if there are a, definitely a bigger amount of requests or requirements. Um, we definitely see it might come up because I think e-commerce is, you know, is definitely more and more uh, a priority, I think, for clients and for builds. So this is what we'll look at later down the line. And then what we're talking about is just some of the ones that are not exactly on the roadmap, um, but something that we will look at doing later down the line, or just, you know, these are, are something that the requests have come in, but it's currently not in the roadmap. So one of them is the import and export of media downloads. Um, this is something we, we can't actually build. So what the request was around was people were looking for a way to import and export media downloads within CSVs. Um, the problem with this is it, it's it's actually not possible through a CSV. This would be a much easier route through an API. Um, it's just the way the you know the the file you know the the documents on a file manager is managed and the, how the URL works. So we're going to look at rather maybe seeing if it does come up more often. Is is there ways for for clients to rather do it through the API route? Okay, and then some of the other ones that have come up. They're currently not on the roadmap, but they are still um, on our uh, on our actual, you know, have been submitted. Subdomain management. So this is currently being discussed with Platform OS. Um, they we're hoping just to hear back from them and see how um, they can help us manage this. It isn't coming up as much, um, and isn't coming up as much as it well. It is coming up a lot more these days, um, but it's still a little bit infrequent as well. Okay. Some of the other requests we've got are things like product reports. So um, this is something that Liz um, in Australia requested. So she does get a, a lot of requests for kind of product reports. So it is there. We haven't it isn't in the set uh, next uh, next steps for the roadmap, but it is something that we are looking into and seeing how we can uh, you know implement it to to allow you to export certain product reports for your clients. And then also what we mentioned, so the order status management, if you remember, we, we spoke about it just now is um, instead of having order status, status management, what we've gone and done is we've actually, we're going to go and build out the order custom fields um, instead. So that'll give you a bit more flexibility um, to have and create your own different statuses um, instead of just having it a specific way and it's managed from within the, the front. Okay. Um, and then we are still getting some uh, requests around like conditional shipping, around weight and location. Um, you know, we're not a, a, a Shopify e-commerce kind of 
completely focused e-commerce, but we obviously want to enable you to, to get the most out of the platform. And built-in condition shipping is something that is on our on our, our roadmap, but it's not a priority that we're going to focus on at the moment. Okay. So as I said, I will send um, I will send on the either on the town hall or the sprint discord channel. I'll add a breakdown of all of these there so you guys are aware of them. And it's got the links to the actual uh, roadmap link. So it's actually there if you want to vote on it or uh, have to see any kind of contextual information as well. Okay. Perfect. Okay, so yeah, so one thing us we wanted to discuss briefly, which is coming up uh, more frequently, and we're finding that it is coming up quite often, is just around the, the site light automation delivery. So as you know, we use SendGrid to, to trigger out um, all our uh, automations. So what, what needs to happen in this process, if you want to troubleshooting delivery of your automations, um, this is the process to do so. So how it works is we've got, a, we've got a transactional instance that's linked to each of your client sites. So all you need to do is just request the instance logins from myself or the site glide team. That'll allow you to log into that transactional instance. Then when you log in, what's best is to go in there and actually authenticate the sending domain um, for your client. So whatever the from domain they're using, if you go in there, you authenticate it. And then during that process, when you're authenticating it, you will also get the unique DCOM records as part of that. So once you've done that, you've gone and added, you've authenticated your domain in SendGrid, you've added the DCAM records and the SBF records to the DNS, that should at least give you a lot more improved delivery as a, as a starting point. One thing just to mention, I haven't spoken, I haven't mentioned it here, but it's probably something we'll talk about a bit later and we're in the process of putting a doc together, is, uh, is DMARC. So SPF and DCOM, very straightforward. They, it's like a, an authentication system. If I'm sending from bill at microsoft.com, we, we need to have that SPF and DCOM to allow us to send on behalf of Microsoft, okay? How DMARC works is it looks at those two records and it says, if you fail on your SPF and DCOM, what happens? What, what happens after that? Do we notify you? How do we manage that? So DMARC is coming up more often especially from Gmail, uh, Google Work, Workplace um, accounts, but we are putting together a bit more of a general SPF, DCOM, and DMARC doc together on the help doc. So that should help you to either generate or help your clients walk through generating their own DMARC policies. Okay. But yeah, that's looking at kind of everything from the roadmap side. It's looking at um, just some just a basic processes to stay, to troubleshoot your delivery of your automations, um, but do reach out to us, you know, for the logins. Um, and also one nice thing also within that SendGrid instance, once you have set up everything, there's also a nice activity tab. So you can go in there and you're able to see your bounce statuses. So you'll also be able to go in there and look at, okay, why did this bounce? It might give you feedback saying it's a DMARC policy or it's some other policy blocking it but you can go and add that within. Okay, perfect. So let's just do this first. Sorry, let me close this. Give me one second. So now that we've gone through that, I'm just briefly going to take you through uh, the new CRM sync module. So like I said, this is just, a, it should be launched. It should be publicly available and uh, on the marketplace of modules in the next week or so. And um, this was set up and built by the guys at Site Gurus. I just want to quickly make sure, I just want to make sure quickly, I'm just going to stop sharing so I can share again and make sure I've got sound. Give me one second. There we go. There we go. So yeah, I do apologize. I was hoping to, to give you guys a nice live demo of the feature, but it's still um, currently getting finalized. But these are just a couple little snippets from one of the developers that did put it together. That just gives you some insight into how the, the module will work. 
um, and we'll take you through it. So this is just a quick view, starting off a view looking within SendGrid. So just keep this in mind. Remember, we I spoke just now and discussed um, each site's got, when it comes to automation mails, each site's got its own transactional instance that's linked to SendGrid. So that's transactional. That's your automations in that side. This module is much more linked to perhaps your clients wanting additional kind of automation functionality around email outside of site cloud. So like I know one thing, I know DJ's on the call. He's got, I think this is quite specific to what DJ wanted. DJ had a client that through a subscription payment for, he wanted a person to purchase the subscription, but then he wanted a way, now the client wanted a way to say after a year or 12 months or whatever the period was, how do we then go and then set up a bit of like a renewal reminder string of communication? Okay, so this is linked for um, the SendGrid marketing campaign side. This is not for the transactional instance of your site. Uh, the nice thing with the SendGrid pricing and packaging, they offer a free package. So the free package starts at I think at like 6,000 credits per month and about 2,000 subscribers. So it's quite a nice entry level kind of usage there if you need to implement just some basic, um, maybe automation sequences from a, a form submission. Okay, so let me just make this full and let's make sure the volume's up. There we go. Okay. Same grid, we've got no contacts at the moment, but we have created two lists, uh, which we'll interact with later. Uh, so, um, most so basically, yeah, that's every everyone, and then these are lists that we'll do later. We're not going to use segments through the API because segments are so automated within this portal anyway that it doesn't. I don't at the moment think there's much point. So that SendGrid it's not had much set up other than these lists. If we go to uh, the site, I've got. Well, in SiteGlide, it's probably useful to have a quick look at CRM. So what we've got set up. Uh, we've got here in the user structure, some custom fields. Um, this one's probably we can use later as a checkbox, but essentially it doesn't really matter what these custom fields are, we will be able to send them to SendGrid, except uh, there is one rule, and that rule is that SendGrid only have three data types. They have a text string, a date, and a um, number. So we're not able to send like an array of data over because it won't work with our automations. So for now, I'm just sending over things that can resolve to one of those three data types and anything else I'm not sending over, which at the moment I think is the best option. We'll just document that. So when you're choosing custom fields, you would just choose one that resolves to that type. If you were to pick, say, a dropdown, that's fine because once one of them is a single dropdown, one of them is picked, you'll end up with one string. So that, that's supported. But if you were to pick, say, a multi drop down that creates an array, um, that is not supported. So, uh, and yeah, checkbox, I think we'll just possibly send the first one. I'm not sure about checkbox. Um, so that's the user structure. Uh, if we go to forms, So that was just a quick view of showing um, how it's set up in SendGrid. So you can have your global um, environment. Then from there, you can um, have your different lists. After that, you can come and see what CRM custom fields you have. And then what we'll show you now is this is just showing more of the actual setup of the automation. So what the actual code input is added. Let me just uh, do it here. Yes, if we click on this one, it's a custom action. It's got a name, it's enabled. Uh, but the code I'm providing from the module is just this include. And you can do quite a lot of things with this include. So to start with, I've set my marketing provider as SendGrid. That's the only one that's supported at the moment, but potentially we can have others in future. And I've got an action. So 
Um, to start with, I've got no context. Uh, let's uh, simulate adding. So if you just use an action to add on its own, it will add that context send grid with no lists. So let's give that a go. And obviously, this this code will this code will run when the form is submitted in, a, in it's written it's in an automation. But you could add this code anywhere. Actually, uh, there's no need for it to be in a automation. If you did want to add it somewhere else, all you'd need to do extra is just pass in which email uh, the email for the user you want to be working with. Um, in in this situation, we don't need to add the email because it's available in the form data. Um, but if it war if the if it wasn't after a form submission, you wouldn't necessarily have that information. So you'd need to pass it in. Um, so, yeah, just going to my form. And we'll submit. So the first thing that should happen in SendGrid is it should, remember we had no custom fields at the beginning, the first thing that should happen is that the custom fields should get automatically populated. There we go. And you see that they're, they're named after, uh, they, they're given a prefix of Cyclide CRM, and that's to distinguish them from any custom fields you might create in SendGrid itself and prevent conflicts, prevent overwriting those. Um, here's the field type text uh, here, and this is so the checkbox itself has not been added because uh, a checkbox could have multiple uh, array type data. So currently, it's not sent over. That's not a problem for us. Um, so that happened already. Context takes a little bit of time to update, but here we go. We've now got one contact. So this was added. So there's the two steps, first the custom fields, then add the contact. And you're able to add, then add all the contacts, custom fields. So that's just showing you just a very quick quick snippet, just to show you what the, the actual code output looks like. Um, one thing that is mentioned during the, the video, just around custom fields. So they did a, a Matt, who, who did create the video, did mention that SendGrid doesn't allow for array custom fields, but he has actually said it has able to get it working now. So instead of, um, you know, instead of just having a single input, what would happen is if you had a, a drop down, uh, you know, selecting multiple items, it'll just comma separate those into the da actual uh, data fields. So it is able to capture multiple interests or, you know, if it's opting into certain interests for a certain brand, it can do that as well. Now what we're going to take a look at is we're just going to jump into a little bit more around um, adding a contact to a list and then also just adding some logic in as well. The nice thing, the nice thing with this module setup, it's very, very straightforward. So um, all you really need is you just need to get an API key from within SendGrid. So in, within the actual uh, SendGrid marketing campaign account. Mm -hmm. And then you just add the API key into the module itself. So it's really easy to set up as well. So this is just talking more about um, not just adding a contact generally to a global list on SendGrid. This is talking about now, how do we want to maybe now add a contact to a specific list? We want to add them to a specific list and then also input some logic around something like a consent checkbox per se. Uh, let's look at lists. So let's say I switch this back to add. And I add a new parameter from lists. And then this is comma separated and then the name from SendGrid. So uh, back on SendGrid, we have a super list and test list. So let's just add those in. separated text. Let's make sure there's no spaces uh, in there that shouldn't be, other than the ones that are in SendGrid. And we save. And what we should expect to happen now is we'll re-add this contact, and we'll also add them to the lists at the same time. Uh, here.
Again, I'll pause because this might take a minute. Here we go. Yep, so it's added them to all contacts and the two lists. Uh, obviously, I can control which list it is by controlling what I put in the parameter. Um, but you can also remove from lists without deleting the user. So if we set up a, like a custom unsubscribe page, we could use this, this include and we could control, allow them to unsubscribe from a particular list. So let's say I want to just unsubscribe from a test list uh, and i would put remove as the action. It's the same action as deleting the user, but if you add lists, it won't delete the user. It will just remove from the lists. I think that was quite clear. Um, again, I'll pause because it'll take. There we go. So we can see that the user has not been deleted this time. They've stayed on the super list, but they've been removed from the test list. Um, so the last thing to show you is a little bit about how you can use this include with a little bit of um, wrap a little bit of logic around it. When I had the original plan, I was going to allow you to like put a, a custom field ID into the into a parameter so that we could run some logic inside. But I actually decided that it was better to allow the logic to exist uh, in the automation itself or or in a place where the agency developer can like interact with it because you may want any kind of logic. I've just really simplified the API into this one line of code. And so the logic can be added around that. Uh, and I'll give you an example. So Yeah, so let's say I add some logic up here. And they change this action to a dynamic variable. This means that I'm looking at this checkbox field that I added, and I, I know that that checkbox field, checkbox field is form field three two. Uh, the result of a checkbox uh, field being submitted in Cyclide is an array um, of every single checked box. So we're just looking at the first checked box, as there's only one, and we're just going to see if it is, please sign me up, which is the value of that particular first checkbox. That might be something else if you had a different checkbox. That's why it's wrapped up here. Uh, then if, if it's please sign me up, we do an add action. If it's a, if not, we do a remove action, and that goes dynamically into our include. So now we can run that form again, and we can use the checkbox. Uh, this will yeah, completely add and completely remove the user. So in reality, you might want to be using lists here. But we will. Uh, this is a nice, simple example. Uh, so first of all, let's take yes. And in fact, actually, it's probably more useful for us to try it with a no, because we already have that user added. So let's see if this, this should actually remove them eventually. Yeah, refresh the page. Just going back on a form is not a good idea. Uh, refresh. Yeah, so we're expecting this to remove them, because we didn't take the checkbox. Just realized I made a bit of a mistake there. I actually had from lists in here. So I'm going to remove that. It's a mistake, it's not... And try again. So this time we should be, rem yeah, we should be removing the user completely. Okay, there we go. The user was removed completely. And let's just finally, let's just see what happens when we check the checkbox, which should cause the user to be added. And there you go, the user was added to your contacts. Um, so yeah, I'm just going to fix custom field sending over. And I'm going to do a few site-specific things for scroll at the top. Yeah, so that's just a, a really sneak peek at just uh, the new module, the new CRM sync module. Um, it's definitely, as I said, just a little bit earlier. It's, it's, we aren't going to look at just setting it up for SendGrid. 
um, it'll definitely be something we'll be able to uh, also run out to things like MailChimp, Active Campaign as well. Um, but currently it is just set up on SendGrid. So if you guys do have any needs or any sort of automation, you know, needs that might sit out of uh, SiteGlide, at least you can sync that data through to SendGrid. Just keep in mind, obviously, the, the sync is a one-way sync. So it is just the adding of contacts. Um, we did chat to Matt and Luke about how we could use it for maybe other CRMs. We just want to see how we're going to have to manage the syncing of data. Are we already just going to be pushing data to a CRM? Um, because it can get quite problematic if you start syncing both ways um, and understanding which where's the where's the source of the data sitting. Okay. But yeah, once that's done, it should be out in the next week or so. I will definitely notify everyone once it is uh, available in the available for installing. But yeah, do reach out. Um, we will have documentation on it as well. And there's some a couple of nice little examples like Matt went through in the recordings. Okay. Yeah, so that's everything from there. And then I just wanted to see if there's any other questions around some of the, maybe around the, the module or some of the, the roadmap items at the moment. Yeah, Colin, uh, uh, do you have, do you know when MailChimp automation would be available for that module? I mean, not yet. <sighs> Yeah, have you have you got a lot of clients that use Mailchimp mostly? Eh? We I use Mailchimp, yeah. Okay, yeah. So I definitely think pro, those are the ones that are on our probably on the next list because those are the the, the main ones. You know, Mailchimp is is massive. Right. So um, I'll chat to Matt Jones at Site Gurus who built the module. Um, it just depends how you know what what's kind of the roadmap on on his part of work and everything, but. I think what he wanted when we discussed it, when Luke and I chatted to him early in the week is what he wanted to know was what are most of your clients using or what are you using the right. most? And, the, and MailChimp was the first one we even said. Right. So, but, but Zapier can integrate with MailChimp too. And I have that going on another platform that works pretty good. But is Zapier on this now? You're, or, you're, or is that coming? Zapier support for Cycler? So Zapier, you can integrate Zapier into MailChimp already. Yeah, yeah, but can you integrate it through SiteLight as well? Yes. Yeah, yeah okay. you can. Awesome. So maybe that's an option for now. Um, right. But yeah, we'll, we'll, I'll keep you in the loop around when uh, MailChimp happens as well. Okay. Sweet. Thank you. Sure. Are there any other questions at all? Or maybe anything around the roadmap items? Or is everyone just thinking all the stuff they can do with the, the sync module, perhaps? <laughs> if there's no other questions or anything, um, what we will be doing, as I said, I will uh, send out an update. So I will send that breakdown of all the, the roadmap items. I'll add it to Discord as well, just so you can see what we're focusing on the next uh, sort of the next sort of features that are coming out. I will go and add it all there. Um, once the CRM sync module is live, I will also communicate that out to everyone in the community and um, definitely give it a try. Um, even just test it out. As I said, it's really simple. You can create a free uh, SendGrid account and it's just as simple as adding the API key in and then you can go and test some, you know, automations linked to that. Luke, is there anything else from your side, perhaps? Um, hi, everyone. I'm not particularly well today, so um, I'm not, not joining the call too much, but here, if anybody does have any, have any questions, and Colin's doing a great job of, uh, of running it. <laughs> um, I just noticed, Colin, there is one one or two questions, well, a question in the chat, so maybe uh, just uh, jump on that one. Okay, thank you. There we go. What about constant contact? Okay, so, yeah, I think, uh, Daniel, I think this is where, it, obviously, we need to decide kind of what is the most used. So, MailChimp was their active campaign. Um, we can add constant contact to the list as well. Um, you know, that's something we can look at as well. 
we'll just need to actually, what we'll also need to do is we might just need to actually put out some feelers to the community and also just find out if we can track what's the most commonly used as well. Um, I will key, we will add that to the list for the module. Um, but as I said, it's we are going to have to focus on kind of maybe the most common systems. Um, I am aware of constant contact, but I know we've got SendGrid and Active Campaign and, and MailChimp as well. So that's definitely something I will add it to the list. So we are aware that is requested, Daniel. And then I think from De from Devon, we have about 40 zaps running from Cyclo Sites. Let us know if we can answer answer any questions okay cool so Devin was just saying Michael they they have a whole bunch of zaps set up from from site live so as I said you know reach out on the on the community channels or the ask any question channel especially if you've got a something that you maybe if you're, if you're not coming right with something and there's always some great examples um you know in the community as I said Luke and I will always say Half the time, we're not always aware of what the exciting things uh, you agencies are doing for clients. So definitely asking in the community helps us and also helps the rest of the agencies um, to bring the most value to their clients. Let me just check here. Brevo, Brevo, okay. Let me go like that. Okay, Alexandra, regarding editing forms, can a client edit a, edit a form from a portal type situation? So. Luke, doesn't that does that link to the the form, the web app form layouts? Is that? Is uh, that right? I'm sorry. The, um, I'm sort of struggling to understand editing forms. Um, if you're using Site Builder for forms, then it's very very easy to update forms. They automatically dynamically update. So yes, in theory, a, a customer can edit a form in the normal UI and it would update uh, on the front end page. And that could be uh, an edit form as well, I think. I don't see any reason why not. Um, okay. uh, yeah, a web app edit form as well, because you're updating web app fields. So I think so. Uh, if not, it should be, but I'm pretty sure it already is. Okay. okay. So um, yeah, I think Alexandra, I think Site Builder would probably be the, the best way on that side. Um, have you have you got a request at the moment or is something that you're looking at for a current build? Um, well, I am working on a portal for a client. I, I hope you can hear me. Um, and we've been using the web app forms for a lot of things because all of that data that's collected goes straight into the web app and then we can put that information in different places, such as in the portal reports and that sort of thing. And I can create on on screen reports. Um, so being able to, for the client, my client, to be able to modify those, um, the data that's in those forms would be extremely helpful, you know, rather than having to log in and do it through the web app. Um, I don't know if that's a possibility or not, but if that is, that would be terrific. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a power, it shows how making forms more easily accessible and editable, uh, how powerful that is. So if you haven't tried the Site Builder forms feature, it's worth trying that. You don't even really have to use the rest of Site Builder if you don't want to. Forms is probably one of the most valuable bits um, that you could could start with. Um, and that would just mean that you, you can benefit from the dyna dynamic updates, the layouts. I, th I think that's, I think if I've understood your use case correctly, you want the customer to be able to just edit the web app at the back end and it automatically update the front end edit form. Is that right? Well, um, we've got the web app set up. There's a lot of different data. So we've, we're using web apps to hold that data. And right now they can certainly go into the back end and update a web app and have the data stored and you can display it in different ways on the website. Um, and including ways that look like reports. Um, but I'm also building a dashboard out for the ad, the client admin to use so that they can just easily uh, change the data without having to get into the back end of the site and possibly break something. Uh, uh, so I'm using the forms that are created within the web apps to, do, to collect a lot of that data so it goes straight into the web app and then we can use that data however we'd like. Um, so I don't know if that form is, allows us to 
um, enable the client to um, be able to just edit from that, from the web app form. I think um, I know what you mean now. Unless it, you could have to log back in to do that. So, so Colin, could you just go back to phase, the next phase, I think it's on that or queued. I, I think, um, Alexander, it, it relates to one of the roadmap features we talked about. If we just quickly go back there. There was one here you one. mentioned editing. Uh, the web app. In the that, there you go, oh, web app edit layout form. Exactly. Yes, okay, that makes more sense there, yeah. So um, having that available by default at the moment, you have to create your own. So um, it's not really going to help the client. I wouldn't have thought it's going to save you having to build that layout from scratch. Okay. Okay. But but it'll help the client because once you've built it, they'll they'll literally be able to use that form to um, edit um, web up items. Okay. Okay. Thanks for. You can do that already, though. <laughs> you can do all of that okay. already. Uh, it's just the this feature is just going to make it's just going to give you a default. Um, edit well I've edit formally out. Mm -hmm. But as I mentioned with site builder you'd actually get all of that already I believe. Um, it'll give you a lot of that out of the box and there is a portal template you can you can start from. Okay, that sounds good. Thank you. While we're here, Colin, if you could just mm -hmm. go back to the first page. Um, I just noticed that maybe a couple of people joined as we were on the later sections of the roadmap. So it might just be worth showing these slides quickly just so that anybody can ask any questions if they wanted to. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, to summarize, this is the, the main ones that we're trying to get through next. Um, based on all the feedback we've had in the last few weeks from the um, Sprint channel and Discord, but also the roadmap generally, um, these are the four that we wanted to, to really get, get done ASAP. <clears throat> um, and they're they're in progress. So yeah, very quickly running through it. Colin's one's kind of done that. Um, so yeah, number two, those are the ones that we want to then get on next. Which I know some of these are were still very important. We just had to pick some that were more immediate. If anybody who who joined later or anybody has any questions on on these, just let us know. Yeah. And then, yeah, as I said, I'll, I will add this breakdown to Discord as well. So you'll have kind of what, what the, the, the plans look like, um, at least you can refer back to them as well. Um, and then we'll have all the links. So if there's specific ones that are important to you, um, maybe also keep in note of, you know, if you have features coming through, just make notes of them. We definitely are planning on doing more sprints like this one. Um, and it's we always will be reaching out to, to you guys just to see what, what are clients asking for? What are key? What is going to simplify your life? Um, so yeah, definitely keep keep aware of any requests or things you feel are missing. And then once we do the next sprint, we can look at uh, you know capturing all extra requests as well. Okay. There we go. Um, I do have one question. Um, maybe it's a I'll, I'll, I can create a web app or a, a roadmap request, but um, one thing that I've noticed, and this might, this might, I noticed you're doing multi images for attributes. So this might relate to how you actually do that. Uh, we use, cause we, we create a lot of relationships between web apps. That's one of the most valuable parts of Cyclide for us. So we'll create database structures where we're using the, um, data source field types, multi multi um, data source. So, for example, you could be in one web app, and in the field of that web app, you're selecting multiple items from another web app, right? Mm -hmm. So that works really, really well for a lot of contexts, and it kind of allows us to build um, like. Uh, just much more efficient databases and databases where you can edit values and one place instead of 40 places and all that stuff. But what one thing that we're noticing about it is that all, um, let's say that I'm, I'll just give you like a, a real world example to make it easy. So let's say you have a blog and you want like related articles or something like that, right? So you're just picking other related articles, five other related articles, and you're picking them and they're showing up. 
And that's nice, but they only show up in the order that you picked them. So you can imagine if you're creating relationships beyond three, four, five, if I go in and I want to create another relationship, let's say it's related. Now it's like a blog. It's a, uh, you know, an SEO uh, kind of like mega guide to a topic or something, right? And so now you've got like 10 or 20 relationships. If I want to add another one, then I'll pick it, but it's going to show up at the bottom. And so there's no there's no way in Cyclide to reorder those, right? It's just, you'd have to literally delete them all repick the 20 again in the order you want and then delete them again and repick them again. So the reason I'm bringing it up is because if you're going to do multi, if you're going to do attribute images, you already have a field type in uh, web apps where you can drag and drop things like, so it's um, the multi image array field type, which was an, it's an awesome, is an awesome field type. If you guys aren't using that, that's su super useful for galleries and things like that. It, literally you're picking images and they're showing up and you can just drag them, reorder them, that kind of thing. So since that's an array and what we have, what I just described is an array that would make Cyclide much more powerful for us. Um, we don't really have an example. We, we don't really have a solution for this because it's cyclide UI. So, but it's mm. like, you've solved it. <laughs> it's yeah. just not, it's just not been applied to all the areas where arrays occur. And so it's just something to think about. Um, it's kind of a nerdy thing, but I think it would just make, it would make the use, <laughs> the use usability of this feature, like much better. And maybe you've already solved it. <laughs> so do you think Devin it's uh sorry I'm, I'm not I'm trying to catch up with it but do you think it's a case of the field type needing to be an array or is it uh, like metadata or um, a setting on the field tag when you output it in the in the list view or detail view no I actually think the field type might already be an array I think it is an array I think you're outputting so like Unless I'm unless I'm misusing that word, I think. Um, uh, okay, so I think in the case of the images example I gave you, which is which is a more recently built uh, field type, it, those are definitely arrays. Like you're just you're just uh, if you just outputted the raw data, it would just be like image one dot jpeg, image two dot jpeg, image three dot jpeg, and in the cyclide UI, you can just make the second one, the third one, and the third one, the first one, you can just move them around, right? And I think the same thing is uh, happening. It, yeah, and like what I'm saying is in your data source fields, like if you if you just output that, that's also outputting an array, but there's no way to do the dragging and dropping, the reordering right. of the data, so that's all I'm saying, yeah. Okay, so the UI, you're looking for the UI functionality of um, that we've already got rather than in the layouts yeah. being able to set like a filter or you know like a sort by or something like that like we have in includes right which which would so like i could do that now right the the silt this i could use weighting or filter or something like that however uh -huh. what we're finding in real world applications is weighting doesn't really do it because if you've got you know if, let's say you've got a thousand articles and you're just picking 10 that relate to this thing Waiting just kind of falls apart for that application for those kind of yeah. relationships. It's like determining the order, or the rank of it. <laughs> uh, you know, there's I can't figure out a way to do it other than output. Uh, we actually, sorry, by default, I think um, what we have figured out how to we figured out how to write some liquid that would. I'll put it in the order that we picked them. Does that make sense? So like they could have IDs and you could do it. There's no uh, there's no filter out of the box that does that. It, it, the filters are like, you know, alpha order, ascending, descending, weight, all those, right? Yeah. But we did write one that would like at least do it in the order we picked them. But now it's becoming unwieldy because there's 20, yeah. there's 25, whatever. And it, it, we're just kind of seeing the limits of that. So yeah. um, 
yeah. Again, I, I realize this is a super specific thing, but I just thought <laughs> it would bring it up because because uh, I think you solved it, but I don't really know. Oh, yeah. I don't know. Maybe that makes not. Sense. maybe not. <laughs> yeah. Hopefully, it, you just want to. Yeah, you just want to be able to drag and re- uh, reorder them in the UI. That's I thought it. it was yeah. more that you wanted to be able to work with the individual items um, in the code in the layout. I thought you wanted to be able to like reorder them or something or fil- filter them in the tag. I think I think we can kind of do that. I mean, because we cool. we could out for example, we can output uh, we could loop through whatever that array is yeah. and do all that. Yeah, so we we've got that covered. I think it's more just cool. My, my clients like, do I really need to repick the twenty when I add one? And I'm like, <laughs> yeah, yep. yeah, That's you okay. do. Sorry. Cool. <laughs> so anyway, uh, suppose I should just create a Colin. Would it be most useful for me to create a roadmap thing for that? Yeah, that, yeah. If you could, Devin, that'd be best. And then yeah. I think we can chat to to Matt about it and just maybe understand, pick his brain around it a little. He bit. would definitely know like how difficult that is or whatever better than me. I'm just guessing. So, mm-hmm. um, okay. Yeah, and yeah, we'll we've obviously got the recording and we can always just try explain it to Matt. But if yeah, if you can explain it, but also Luke understands what what you're asking, so that I can explain that. it in a screencast for Matt. I kind of do that a lot, so okay. that's, that's easy. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, okay. Uh, there is a there's a roadmap task already, uh, roadmap item already about multi data source output order uh, from you, Devon. Um, oh, and I think you've. I think this one's been solved, so that's why I asked the question. Um, that one, I, I that one's been solved question... by our. Yeah, that was solved by our like um, what I just referenced, which was a, the liquid we yeah. wrote to output the order. But uh, yeah, I could tag. On, I mean, well, I, I guess I probably so, should yeah. create. Should I create a new one or? Uh, I don't know. It depends if it's it's kind of the same thing. You even write at the bottom. I think bonus point allow for drag drop reordering <laughs> of items. <laughs> so, um, so it probably so is the same one. Do you, do you want to, Luke? Can you throw can you throw the link to that in the chat so I can not sure d- dig yeah. forever for that? Especially if it's solved. I'm like I don't know. So if well, I if I it marks as under review, so that's why I'm not sure. Uh, okay, cool, cool, cool. Yeah, agree. So I can I can add a comment to that. Um, yeah, basically, let us know whether you think it's the the core problem solved, and yeah, maybe then update it. We'll update it just to be the the dragging and dropping. Yeah. All right. Sounds good. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks everyone for listening to my super specific thing. <laughs> I missed a bit of context there, Devin, but we might be able to do a, a fancy uh, graph tree to solve it in the meantime if it uh, if it isn't resolved. Okay, it's yeah, UI, it's so, UI. I think it's like wide UI, uh, so I think it might be a little tricky. Yeah. It's the fact that the user needs to define the order, so it has to be done in the UI. Ah, uh, I see. Could be um, could do something similar that we discussed with waiting with that drag and drop thing, like. Yeah, um, but I think Colin, uh, Colin, sorry, Devon might be right that we potentially solved the uh, solved it already because we already have drag and drop reordering. So hopefully we can just use that. <laughs> but yeah, I can see it's five past the hour. So I think yeah, I just wanted to finish off and. I know you guys are probably morning that side or midday, but yeah, enjoy the rest of your guys' day. Um, definitely thanks for everyone for joining the session. As mentioned, I will send out the, the recap of all the, the roadmap plans, um, and then we'll have the, 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 the recordings out in the next day or two. So yeah, thanks everyone for joining the session. I hope you guys have a, a good day and everyone that's also listening. Um, thanks so much. I think there we go. Thanks, Helen. Thanks, Glenn. Um, but yeah, we'll see you all at the next town hall. Thanks so much. Cheers. Have a good week, guys. Thanks, everyone. Ciao. Cheers.